Psalms 86, verse 11, and it says, Teach me more about you, how you work and how you move, so that I can walk onward in your truth until everything within me brings honor to your name. You may have your seat in the presence of our life-changing king, and what's his name? We bless that wonderful name of Jesus, nobody like Jesus. Oh, the lover of my soul, Jesus. Oh, I just get happy when I call on Jesus. I, the joy of the Lord just begin to be my strength when I can say Jesus. Oh, how sweet the name of Jesus. So we thank God for the reading of his word. So we're going to minister to you. We've entered into our mantra for the 2023 year. And it's God's working in and through me in 2023. But because of this time and this time of consecration, and we've, we've sought, the, sought the Lord together corporately, and we pray that you have sought him individually for those things that you're believing God for, the title for today's message is God's, God's working in and through you. Do your part. We recognize that God is looking for mankind to be conduits of his power in this earth. God is looking for mankind to be conduits through which heaven is extended to the earth. In particular, God is looking for believers. And we're not going to deal too much with that believers part today, um, Elder Samal, because I don't want y'all to be in here till 6 o'clock. For the fast and prayer and consecration, but you can't eat anyway. We can bring you some juice and some water. You know what I'm saying? We can refresh you, splash some water on your face. You, we got restrooms. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying. But he is looking at this time for those that would do his bidding in the earth. You know, and, 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 and this time when we, we come to church day in and day out and we come to the house of the Lord because God continues to use men and women of God all over the earth to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to get people to believe. And we keep being in a place, Elder Glennis, where we keep trying to get the people of God to believe the gospel. That's the problem. The ends, the ups, the downs, the cycles of defeats, the in church today and out of church tomorrow, it's a problem with your belief system. So we're failing to believe the gospel. And God is saying, if I'm going to work in you and through you, your responsibility is to believe. But see, we're not going to deal with belief today. We'll deal with that next week. But I want you to think about that. Because in order for us to be kingdom ambassadors and extensions of heaven and the earth, we got to have a level of faith and belief in God to be available unto him, to be used by him, and to speak for him and be obedient unto him. See, the problem is a lot of us are not doing different things because that we don't really believe that. Therein lies the problem. We want to sit. We want to come to church. We want to say, well, God is working in me and through me. And we just sitting there like a bump on a log. God is working in me and through me. And we just at the house complaining and crying. God is working in me and through me. And when I become faced with a challenge, all I do is cry and whine in the presence of God. Well, God says, everything that's been proclaimed over the years. Everything that you've sat under and heard in churches that blessed your soul and it was imparted in your spirit. Every promise that he made you and you wrote it down in your journal, it's still good. But can I tell you, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. God is not going to take over your will. What good is the worshiper if the worshiper wills not to worship? He, he gave us a will. He wants you to make the decision. He gives you the choice to choose between life and godliness. And he says, I have not changed. I'm God. I changed not. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And if this thing is going to manifest in your life, you're going to have to do something. We get mad at the church. We get offended. It's something wrong with our belief. We stop believing God. We 
stop believing that he said that. Lord, did you really say that? Then we start doubting if we heard what we thought we heard. The enemy attacks our belief. So God is trying to get his people to get back to a place of intimacy. Y'all, I'm, I'm the prayer teacher, preacher. Get back to a place of intimacy because that is the place where you build and strengthen and fortify your belief system. That's why it's so important. That's why I always talk about it when I get up. That's why it always comes into messages because this is where God communicates with you. If we're at a place of intimacy and prayer with God and we're allowing him to speak to us in good times and bad times, when those bad times come and those trying times come, we're running to the same place that we've always ran so that we can find the strength and the restoration we need even in the bad times. I remember I was, I was um, thinking back to um, that Chosen series, and um, it was some different stuff going on, you know, in um, Mary. And God had brought forth a great deliverance in Mary. But Mary had gotten to a place of a small of frustration. And Jesus was busy, you know, preparing for this great sermon, according to the movie, y'all. But it, it lines up with the Bible. You got to read the Bible, too. But Jesus was getting ready to prepare this great ser um, sermon for the masses and the multitude. So it seemingly Jesus wasn't present or available for Mary at that time. She was frustrated and, and she was frustrated. She was trying to learn the Torah and all of that stuff. And she just got in a place of frustration and then all of the old things revisited. The old feelings, the old thoughts and mindset. All of those things start coming back to her. And instead of finding Jesus, one of the disciples even said to her, did you talk to Jesus about that? Did you talk to Jesus? She said, no, I don't want to bother him. Did you talk to Jesus about that? No, you know, he's busy. Did you talk to Jesus about that? Mary failed to talk to Jesus about that. So then she succumbed to the old nature. She went back to what she was familiar to, went back, got drunk, started back gambling, all of these things because she didn't talk to Jesus about it. So that's why I said all that to say, that's why prayer and intimacy is so, intimacy is so important because God wants us to remain in a place of talking to him. He wants us to stay in this place where we reverence who he is. He wants us to stay in this place where we reverence what he has to say. When we pray, Elder Teresa, we're saying that, Lord, it matters what you have to say. It matters to me how you feel about this. It matters to me what you want me to do. So that's the place God is bringing us back to. So even let's look at this text. Because see here, the, the, you, can't, you can't say, I mean, you can't read this text without seeing that it is a prayer. It's a prayer. Some say it's David's prayer that he prayed. Other folks claim stuff. And I'm, I'm, I claim everything in the Bible. Everything that is good, true, of good report, and, and, and virtue and praise. Because the Bible is not just a book of old stories and history, but it tells me of my Savior's history. It tells me of my Savior's divinity and humanity. It tells me of my Savior's purpose and plan for my life and for the earth and mankind. So if we really believe, we'll want to know about the Creator's purpose and plan and how it came to be and what it means for us today. So we're going to look at that. So this Psalms is David prayer. And it sounds like he's a man in trouble. If you look at this, it sounds like he's a man in trouble and in desperate need of help. So even as we look at this, verse 1, Psalms 86, and I'm going to do it in the King James Version because I like the King James Version as well. Let me say that. So it says, bow down thine ear. O oh Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. So right here, 
David recognized because of his intimacy with God and his relationship with God, he recognized like right now within his soul, he's poor and needy. He is in desperate need of God. He has a dependency upon the spirit of God. He has enough sense to know that when I'm in this place, I can't depend upon my own self. I can't, I can't rely on my own strength. I can't, ooh, I can't analyze this with my own perspective because I'm in a place of being poor and needy. So then he says, preserve my soul for I am holy. O thou my God. Save the servant that trusted in him. So right off the bat, David is asking the Lord to preserve his soul. And then right behind it, he says, for I am holy. See, he recognized his spiritual position. He recognized his spiritual position. Father, I've received you as my personal savior. I believe that you died on Calvary's cross. I believe in God. And I believe in the redemptive plan of God for the earth. So this is what I believe. So I am holy. My spiritual position is holy. But right now my soul needs to be preserved. So think about this. See, it's not a problem whether or not you save or not. Your soul needs the deliverance. Your soul needs saving. And when we talk about saving, that's a I N G. Every time I get, my soul gets me in trouble. Every time my soul tries to rise up, God, my soul needs saving. So this is the thing. See, David is lifting up his soul with application because of his prayer. Because of his intercession, because of what he says after he asked the Lord to preserve his soul. So what is taking place, even with us on today, we're getting into places and we're not asking God to save our soul. We're not, another way said, we're not lifting up our soul to God. We have these things that's going on in our life. Yeah, you save your eternal soul, salvation. You make it to heaven when you die. But when we have all of these trials and all of these tests and we have these flesh issues and we have all of this carnality in our life, that means our soul has not been lifted up to God. Save our soul, God. So even as he goes on, he says, Oh, thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. He trusts God. He don't have a problem with believing God here because of his communication in the text. He recognized that the enemy of his soul, whatever it may be, is trying to take him out, trying to get him to focus in on the circumstance, trying to get him to focus in on the problem. But God, I'm not going to give that my attention. I need you to preserve my soul. I need you to regulate my mind. I need you, God, to get this thing within me that's trying to overtake me out of me, God, because there's another member in my, in my members. There's another law in my members, but that law has to submit to your law when I surrender it unto you. So that's what's taking place. Whenever your direction or counsel is unto God, he's ready to, to give it to you. He's ready to give you instruction wholeheartedly. He's ready for you to receive it. And so then as we go on, look, he says, trusteth in thee. Then he says, verse three, be merciful unto me, O Lord. Be merciful unto me, O Lord. Then he says, David's responsibility as well as your responsibility for I cry unto thee daily. I cry unto thee daily. Be merciful unto me, O God. I cry unto thee daily. That is constant in prayer. Ongoing prayer. Not setting myself up to go pray. But ongoing prayer. Not just going to pray when I have this challenge and it's just so overwhelming and I just can't take no more. I cry out for help. No, my responsibility is to forever cry out unto him. But then before he gets to cry out, you see how he says, be merciful unto me. Oh, Lord, 
he recognized the value of God's mercy. Do we recognize the value of God's mercy? God giving us what we do not deserve. So then he says, rejoice the soul of thy servant. For unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. See, David is lifting up his soul unto the Lord. He said, I'm lifting it up to you, God. And so he says, I want you to rejoice that my soul now is in tune with my spirit, man, and with your spirit so that you're pleased with my thoughts, my behavior, my conversation. Are y'all following me in this text? So then he says, mm -mm 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 -mm. verse 5, for thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. See, before we, before we go there, and I was looking at this in, in this text, rejoice the soul of thy servant for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. <laughs> we got to send our soul to meet God. I ain't talking about you dying and going to glory. You got to send your soul to meet God. That thing you want to say, that cuss out you want to give, send your soul to God. That thought you have it, that you know is contrary to the word of God, and that's not godly and holy, send that soul to God. Child, please. So then verse 5 says, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and tune into this, and plenty us in mercy. Plenty us in mercy unto all them that call it upon thee. Plenty us in mercy. See, David had enough sense to magnify the mercy of God. He magnified the mercy of God. When you magnify something, you enlarge it. You make it big. See, some of us are making too little in light of the mercy of God. That's why we can't receive breakthrough. That's why we don't believe he's forgiven us. That's why we don't believe that he will love us unconditionally and his love never fails because we've made little and light the mercy of God. Even a little bit of it is good. So David had enough sense to say, this problem is not too big for you. This ain't nothing that's out of the way beyond, past your power and past your authority. So God be plenteous in mercy. See, magnify your mercy when it comes to me. Because I'm forever messing up. I'm forever falling short. I'm forever in and out of this situation. I'm forever breaking your heart. God multiply. Make it plenteous towards me. If nobody else, see, that's humility too. You don't think you got it going on. You don't think you're altogether lovely, but you recognize that if it had not been for the mercy of God, if it had not been for his grace, that you would be a lost soul and you're halfway there now, but you have to remember the mercy. Plenteous in mercy. Maybe some of y'all don't know what mercy is. Mercy is compassion. Forgiveness shown towards someone when it is in, within one's power to punish. It's within his power to cut you off and separate you from him. Because of the sin, because of the disobedience, because of the not obeying his word, because of you breaking his heart, because of us disappointing him. It's enough. That's enough to separate you forever from the presence of God. But David got enough sense to say, Lord, have mercy upon me according to thy loving kindness the multitude of thy tender verses blot out my transgressions because I've sinned against you and you only. Wash me so I'll be clean. See, some of us so full of pride, we don't feel like we need to be washed, forgiven, loved, shown compassion, and given mercy to. 
The enemy has fooled some of us and did such a number on our mind and in our thoughts that we're saying that, God, that's unforgivable. I don't, your mercy can't cover this. Your mercy is not enough. When we stay in sin, when we stay be living below the privilege and the means that God has given unto us, that he died to give us, we're saying your mercy is not enough. You know how much that mercy costs to give us. It was costly. But when you don't believe, it don't matter. You see how belief connects? When you don't believe, all this I'm doing up here, all this I'm going through, Lord have mercy in my spirit. <laughs> Why you got to do all that? You don't believe. You, don't, you got saints that's been coming to church, got years behind talking about their salvation, but they don't believe. We say, Lord, we believe you for miracles, signs, and wonders. We say, we believe you for the miraculous. We say, we believe you for healing. We believe you for this. We believe you for that. And then we can't even believe him to, to bring somebody in our path that we can meet, pay our rent. We don't believe him enough to believe that if I return the tithe, that he will rebuke the devourer for my sake and that he will not destroy the fruit of my ground. Neither shall my vine cast a fruit before the time in the field, said the Lord of hosts. And he, I don't believe that all nations going to call me blessed and I'm going to be a delightsome land. That's what you said, Lord, but I don't believe that. How does it tell me I don't believe because I don't do? I don't believe in the tithing principle. I don't believe in the prosperity of God and how he's given it to me because I don't return the tithe. Because my responsibility, it, that is my doing. To do. Return. See how we have a responsibility? I heard my bishop say last week, I think it was, he was saying the church has did a poor job with getting the people to recognize their responsibility in Christianity. I'm walking all the way over here today. It's a thing to wear, Brother Michael, that we have faith. And we spiritualize everything in the church. But don't connect the two. So that's why our life looks like this. Because it says church, spiritual things. That's what I do to church in the fast. I'm going to fast. But come Monday, because we ain't fasting no more. But my human responsibility. I have a responsibility to keep my life as consecrated unto God. I have a responsibility because of what God just said. And I believe him that I got to live a life of consecration. Now I got to develop a regimen. I got to get a plan that keeps me in this place of consecration. When I believe. But when it's questionable. I can take it or leave it. I did that because the church was doing that. I ain't really doing that. We still reading the Bible, y'all. Y'all see, see this in the Word? Y'all hear what the Lord is saying to us? Okay. So that plenteous and mercy messed me up. I hollered a, a lot. And y'all know I can holler. I hollered... <laughs> I hollered and wailed a lot because that thing jumped on me. Like, God, your mercy. Ooh, we need your mercy. If it had not been for your mercy. My, 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 my. So then he says, give ear. And then he calls upon God. So that, that calling is important. We're going to talk about that next week. Your believing and calling upon. Those are important in your Christian life. Verse 6 says, give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer. Give ear unto my prayer and attend to the voice of my supplication. So David had here going on prayer and supplication. That was his responsibility. Y'all going to catch that responsibility after a while. That's your doing your part, I'm telling you. Verse 7, it says, in the day of my trouble, 
I will call upon thee. That's your responsibility. That's your responsibility. God is God all by himself and he's going to do what he's going to do. But you have a part to play in the plan of God for your life and the breakthrough and your sustained breakthrough for your life. Do your part. The preacher can't do your part for you. No matter how much we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can't believe for you. We can't walk it out for you. We can't tell you, cry, we can tell you, cry out to God, but we can't go cry out to God for you. And we want it for you all day long. Sometimes it's so grieving how much we want it for you. It's such a travail that, that sometimes I just be praying, God, just overtake them. Don't allow them. But that goes against his nature. Please, Jesus, show them, God. Show them that that's pride when they do that. Show them that that's pride when they don't lean on you. Show them God. Show them God. Show them God. And God is showing some of us and we're just dismissing what we're seeing. Because we're looking for something else. Greater, like we like to say, Elder Teresa. Deeper. Can you get obedience down? Can you get crying upon down? Can you pray to him? Get that down. Not when you're in trouble. Not when you're in the midst of a situation. Oh, we can get you to worship all day long because you're in desperate need for a breakthrough. But he says, I want this to be your life so that it's not a problem with you coming to me. I want this to be your life because now you're building up your belief in the gospel. All right. In the day. Oh, my God. In the day of trouble, I will call upon thee. For thou will answer me. That's faith speaking. But if I've not gotten in the presence of God, I've not called upon him. I didn't recognize the plenteous of his mercy. I don't recognize that I'm holy. I don't believe that he will answer. Verse 8. Among the gods, there is none like unto thee, O Lord. Neither are there any works like unto thy works. So even when we, when we look at what David is, is going on, he's continuing to cry out to God, and he's continuing, y'all see this? He's continuing to remind God of who he is and how he is. He's reminding God of his characteristics. He's not trying to get it twisted and, and say how good he is or God should do this for him because of how great he is as David. You know what I'm saying? You know my history, Jesus. But no, he's reminding God of who he is. And he's saying, God, do this because of who you are. And because of how I recognize who you are and how less I am. And how I am not. And how I need you. This is showing a dependency upon God. He get into a place, even looking at this, he gets into a place during his prayer. When he's going through, and you, and you can hear it if you study, study the text. He's going through so much in, with the words he's using. Can y'all hear the anger? No, because y'all just reading it. But let it been y'all last week or whatever situation y'all just, or even in the midst of. Put yourself right there and don't just read David's words for David's words. Then you will feel the anguish. Then you will see the desperation. Then you will see the confusion. Then you can see how probably he struggled with doubt, fear, and unbelief. And how his mind was probably all over the place. Now y'all ready to read again? I'm telling you. We have to see this. So even when we're looking at this text and we see um, what place David was in in his prayer, you can see that he's going through too much for his analysis to be accurate. For his analysis to be accurate, complete, or plausible. So he's saying, God, I'm all over the place. Ain't no way I can see or make plain what is happening in my life right now and what you even doing in the midst of it. Lord, ain't no way I can see plainly and clearly from my perspective how this is a good thing for me. So that's why he prays. That's why he cries out unto God. That's why he lifts up his voice in adoration and continues on to get us to our mantra. Y'all following? Okay. 
So then it says, among the gods, there is none like unto thee, O Lord. Neither are there work, any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. See, he given the Lord praise. He had enough sense not to be complaining, whining, and crying. He just started lifting up the name of Jesus. Then, then he says, for thou art great and dost wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Thou art great. See, he says it ain't no problem with you. God, I don't blame you. I don't blame you for what I'm going through. I don't blame you falsely or accuse you falsely for what I'm in the midst of. I'm taking responsibility for right now my situation and my response to what I'm going through. Know why we know that? What, that's what's going on with him? Cause of verse 11. Like what we like to jump to. Because it's the mantra and it sounds good. He says, teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. This right here tells me that David began to know that the only way I'm going to get through this thing, the only way that I'm going to stay connected to Jesus is if you teach me your ways. The only way that I'm going to experience this breakthrough and be sustained and not lose my mind or lose my life, God, teach me your way that I may walk in truth. Because right now, I'm faltering in my faith because of this challenge. Right now, what I'm facing is giving me a different perspective. So, Father, show me your ways. It says, unite my heart to fear thy name. The fear of the Lord, that's why it's so important. You know he's been talking about the anointing and how the, we have to cultivate the anointing on our life. And in order to cultivate that anointing, there has to be the fear of the Lord. When there's a fear of the Lord, then you reverence him at all times. You, you're aware of his cognizance and eminence all at the same time. You're, you're, you're aware that he knows what I'm in the midst of and the challenge that I'm going through. God, you see my feelings. You see my thought. You see that thought, too, that I shouldn't have had. So, Lord, teach me your ways. I can imagine that even when he was in the midst of it and all of these things were happening to him, he had ungodly thought and wanted to have an ungodly conversation. And then immediately, because of the fear of the Lord, it arrested him. Holy Ghost arrested him and said, teach me your ways, God, because, God, that's not your way. God. God, that's not your thought. God, that's not your behavior. <laughs> Lord, that's not it. <laughs> he says, God, I want to walk in your truth. I want to walk in your truth. This is lifestyle consecration. This is the life of a Christian. This is not the in and the outs and the ups and the downs. See, we haven't learned the knowledge of him. We have not learned his ways when we're in and out like that. We have not learned his ways. It should just tell us when we fall and we have slip ups. Oh, God, I need to know your ways. Teach, teach me your ways. I need to learn of you. Learn of the knowledge of you. When we, want, when we, when we cuss somebody out, God, teach me your ways. When we have that bad attitude and want to get offended because somebody done said something, did something, God, teach me your ways. I don't want my perception to take me out of destiny. I don't want my perception of this thing to help me abort my purpose. See, some of us are so wrapped up and tied up into our own perspectives, wrapped up and tied up into our own teachings and ways, wrapped up and tied up into our own will and that soul that's out of control. So when the word comes, it just glaze. When the word comes, well, goodness, I understand that. That's why there's no spiritual understanding. That's why you question every question, every question in the Bible, because the spirit of truth is not reigning on the inward parts. There is no holy reverence for God. So Holy Spirit's ministry is not in effect in your life. And you can't have spiritual understanding. So you're walking, talking ignorance. You walk and talking rebellion to the word of God. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. 
And that's what's happening. That's the breakdown, Minister Rachel. Because we don't believe. We believe more what we got going on in saying than what the word says. I don't believe that. I can see if it was man's word. We, we came and said something to you that you couldn't find in the Bible. Or we came up, Elder Teresa, with a theology that said, whoo, 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 ain't going to name nothing. <laughs> but wasn't in the Bible. You couldn't line upon line and precept upon precept. You couldn't study it out of the word of God. You couldn't get your commentary and cross-reference it. You couldn't find another scripture that verifies that scripture. Then, <laughs> anyway, that's why I said teach me more about you, how you work, and how you move. Because we still, God, we, we saying and we proclaim that God is working in me. He's working through me. Do your part. Do your part. Then it continues, so, so that I can walk onward in your truth. This is the part that is so beautiful and the reason why this consecration is so important at the beginning of the year. And just the timing of everything from first fruit, the first service, and, and just the consecration, all of this thing. It says, <laughs> so I can walk onward in your truth until everything within me brings honor to your name. Everything within me brings honor to your name. Unite my heart, oh God, that my heart is not single or entire of itself, that my heart is not bent towards its own will and its own way. But God, unite my heart with your truth so that I can go onward in you, so that I can walk forward in your truth, so that my life, everything I do brings your glory. Everything I do brings your honor. Every conversation, every relationship, every behavior it brings you honor every service I offer unto you everything brings you honor how we're Christians and we don't care if our king is honored or not we don't care if he's pleased or not We don't care. But he says, I'm bringing you to a place. I brought you to this place, even during this fasting consecration, that I want your life to bring honor to my name. Everything. Come on, I'm ready. Because they're going to be here to six if I don't. Everything brings you honor. So much so there's a fear and a reverence for God. Not that you perfect and you won't make mistakes because we all in the flesh and we get in the flesh, child. And I'm sure y'all had some flesh challenges during this consecration that you. But the thing about it, during this consecration, during those uh, flesh challenges, you immediately got authority over it. Because you were intentional about keeping your consecration. You were intentional, intentional about not losing this place in this space and Lord sacrificing all of this just to blow it for that. <laughs> Can I tell you that's how he wants our life? That there's such a reverent fear. That there's such an honor that everything that you do, you want to bring glory and honor to my name. You ain't going to blow it for that. You ain't going to blow it for that ungodly relationship. You ain't going to blow it for that booty call. 30, 45 minutes for an hour, I just blew it. I ain't going to blow it for that lustful thought. I ain't going to blow it for telling you off and cussing you out. You ain't worth it. You're not worth my peace. You're not worth the anointing and the oil that's dripping off of my life. You're not worth my position and my space and posture in God. You're not worth that. It's not worth that. We got to have enough spiritual discernment that we're able to discern the spirit behind the thing. And arrest that spirit. Not attack that person, but that spirit of arrogance.
Sarah, I come against you in Jesus' name. You will no longer have rule or authority in my space. I will no longer give you my ear. Recognize the spirit. See, that's why we got to remain in this place. And that's why we got to get him to teach us his ways and the way that he do. Because we got to have discernment. We spend a whole lot of time fighting people. Fussing, fight, fussing, fight. Same old argument. Everything. Next week is a different part of the argument. Recognize the spirit. Every argumentative spirit, I bind you in Jesus' name. Every spirit of disharmony and disagreement, I come against your assignment to enter into my marriage and my relationship and even into the conversations that I'm supposed to have so you will not have no rule, you will not have victory, you will not win today because I'm intentional about the things of God. And so God, right now I pray because I need help. I cry out unto you. Teach me your ways. Show me how you work. Show me how you work. I don't know, obviously. I've been doing this for years. But God, I want different. I want lasting change. I want the victory and deliverance that only you can bring. So my life has got to honor you as I fear you. Everybody resting on your feet.